beautiful, sexy person? Are you feeling almost irrationally irritated or on the verge of a mental breakdown? Has your search for a worthy partner been almost fruitless? Do you keep trying to connect with people that just give you the ick? Try Valesa. Today, Valesa is teaming up with God is Grey for a giveaway where absolutely everybody wins. You get a free toy or gift card for a toy when you sign up at the link below. Valesa is an inclusive and women-run brand that specializes in all things sexuality, from erotica to sex ed to vibrators, like my favorite, Valesa's Pebble, an egg-shaped toy made of super smooth silicone. And with just one button, you get 10 different settings. Or fall head over heels for Balesa's Air Vibe, which provides internal and external stimulation. Though she's super silent, the Air Vibe's impact will not disappoint. The Demi Wand is another little cutie, suitable for all body types, 100% waterproof, and with a discreet carrying case. Or for even more fun, get into Balesa's Finger Pro. The Finger Pro slips right on to get you right off. Balesa's mission is to empower everyone to embrace, explore, and celebrate our sexuality. So go to Balesa and explore a world of erotica. And today, my friends at Balesa and I are doing a giveaway where everybody wins. Click the description below for your free gift from Balesa. Hello, you exceptionally beautiful, vibrant, gorgeous person. Welcome to the series finale of God is Grey. That's right, this is our very last episode. And I want to begin by saying, holy moly, I love you each so very much. And I'm honored you came on this wild ass ride alongside of me. After five over the top roller coaster like years of God is Grey, I stopped posting because to me, this project is simply complete. Just like a TV series eventually must come to an end, I found my ending to God is Grey, but I don't want to leave you, my beautiful person, hanging. So for our finale episode, this is going to be an intimate slice of life, one that I suspect you may relate to in many ways, if not some. Today, I'm sharing a private conversation between myself and my parents. I recorded this at the prompt of a friend, and I, of course, have both parents' consent to share it with you today. So for backstory, my dad is in his 80s and was arguably my very first religious bully. And, you know, I'm sure my conservative dad has felt like I was his bully at times as well, because we historically just haven't seen eye to eye on many things, to put it lightly. It's been like a trash fire level, tear soaked firestorm between him and I, actually. But this conversation is so very different. Um, I do dominate it a bit, dominate it a bit, I will say that, but I was really, I don't know, we're listening to each other, we're taking each other in, and that has really come after so many years of learning deeper levels of compassion and love and understanding for one another. A lot of my compassion for my dad comes from just listening to his stories and understanding what it's like a little bit better to live in his skin. So this conversation in particular took place a few days ago, and I hope it shows you just how far this love and understanding goes. My dad and I have come such a long way, and my mom, who's a magnificent person, any Reiki master, if y'all need one, <laughs> um, she chimes in occasionally too. So you'll be like a fly on the wall, or actually a butterfly, or something alternatively gorgeous, if you prefer, while we discuss like so much uh, gender, sexuality, climate change, witchcraft, drugs, poverty, the state of the modern church is thread through this entire conversation. And we talk about the Dalai Lama as well, because I got some shit to say about that. So 
uh, I kept thinking I learned to da uh, drive on my dad's car, which was a 1989 Plymouth Horizon. If anyone is familiar, it's like a hatchback. <laughs> and that thing used to accelerate from zero to 100 miles per hour in like an hour. That's how it felt. So this conversation to me feels that way, too. We start just having an earnest conversation about death, which is something I've never really gotten into with my dad and like I said he's in his 80s so as much as I'd like for him to be immortal I know we will eventually will be um knowing each other from completely different realms or whatever you believe happens so we talk about that and it accelerates and accelerates from there because I start popping off and expressing a lot of my views and um yeah so a zero to a hundred in 50 minutes or so is what this conversation is going to be. Quickly, let me just give you a few disclaimers so you understand this conversation and our references more completely because this is intimate, um, so you won't know everything that we're talking about. One, even though my views have expanded beyond what I ever imagined, <laughs> they truly have, and it's so freeing, let me tell you. In this conversation, you'll hear me honor the language that my conservative dad uses, like referring to God as he knows God, because the kindest thing I believe we can do is honor a person's preferred language. And can I get an amen from my non-binary babes and my trans lovers, etc. So I, I honor people and the, the language that they prefer. So you'll hear that in this conversation. Number two, holy shit, I'd like to apologize for my egregious overuse of the word like. <laughs> I found myself using like like an um, it's just uh, a pause. And if you're annoyed, please know that I am annoyed with myself. So we're in that annoyance together. I'm with you. Three, if you hear birds chirping as they are right now, it's the baby chicks who are nesting in my home office. And we'll leave that there. Four, there is a plot twist in this conversation. Something incredible that I learned about my father's mother. I have always felt a very strong connection to my grandmother, my Polish babsha, but my dad raised me to fear her because she was a psychic and a witch, and I have come to embrace the fact that I share many of her intuitive gifts. So you'll hear me channel her at times. And let's see, five, the trans documentary I refer to but cannot remember is... Laverne Cox's Disclosure, which I highly recommend. And then lastly, six, I refer to a close family member and their issues with addiction. So I'm blanking out their name in order to honor their privacy, which I'm sure you'll understand. So without further ado, enjoy the series finale of God is Grey. And my beautiful people, this episode is dedicated to you. I love you. God bless. I guess I'm saying, well, listen, Lord, your plan is not my plan. My plan sounds a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dad, I have to ask, what is your relationship with aging and dying? Like... What is your, like, if that is you really letting go and trusting, like, can you let your body continue to fall apart in certain ways? And I don't want that to be your destiny, but, like, I just really don't know how you feel about aging and death because we've never talked about it. Yeah, no. Well... Last time we talked, you said you were scared. And you also said that you hope you blow up in a building so that your body doesn't exist, so no one has to see you dead. <laughs> Great. Oh, my God. That's horrible. Is that still what you want to happen? <laughs> Isn't that horrible, Pat? Oh, well, we blew up and we have no body. Yeah, but if it if it happened, I would honestly be so happy for him. I would be like, that is exactly what he wanted. Good for him. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking one time we were watching TV, 
and they were doing, I, I think it was on Saturday Night Live, they were doing a spoof of MacGyver. You know who that is, right? Yeah. And uh, I was watching it, and MacGyver was trying to disarm this bomb before it blew up. And there were, you know, other people standing around him. And he waited too long, and he blew up. That's so funny. Mom, I mean, do you really want to impede on dad's wishes to be blown up to smithereens? If that's what he really wants. He doesn't want us to find his body and he, oh, maybe wants another life somewhere else. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to fake his body exploding <laughs> at uh, 80. How old are you? <laughs> 82. He's got some other woman on the Start side. a new family. Start a new life. New family, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dad, Dad, how does it feel to be older? Because, like, I, I remember I didn't even realize that you were old until we were in London and men and women were standing up for you when we got on the subway. And that was the very first time I was like, oh, my God, my dad is old. <laughs> <laughs> like, if men stood up, fine. But the women, I was like, women were, like, taking their babies off of chairs. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That I mean, great. Okay, great. Yeah, that'd be so great. <laughs> well, and also though, can you do you have peace with the fact that your body doesn't really regenerate after a certain time? It doesn't regenerate. Yeah, like you can't really you can only push medical professions so hard before <laughs> they don't have anything else, you know? Yeah, I know, like, uh, like Poppy Joe, mm -hmm. they they stopped the chemo and everything. It's like, yeah. Like, you know, you know, no, they they were keeping going. He's still doing chemo. Oh, he is. But oh. they said he's uh he's he's not in remission or anything. He's you know getting worse. And uh, but of course they may have some other amazing thing they could torture him with, with lots and lots of side effects. I know that's that's the thing. I don't like our our society is so uncomfortable with death that we don't we don't let each other die. Aging is one thing, but then letting like coming to peace with the fact that your body is going to keep going downhill and just having to contend with that would be like I don't I can't imagine you know you know what that, that's amazing that you're talking like that because you know who Norm MacDonald was right the comedian yeah the comedian yeah he was talking something about he says well you know what I don't like is people saying uh well he battled cancer to the very last day and cancer won and he said no, that's not the way it is. Sure, I've been battling cancer, and you say cancer won. But you know what? When I die, when my body dies, the cancer dies with me. So I think it's a draw. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah that's perfect, yeah. Not taking cancer with me. Well, and that's a perfect example of like um, the language we use in our society around death. Like there's so many medical misnomers. It's absurd. Like that it, it doesn't, I don't know, the word battle, I don't like it. And I've talked to other people who have cancer and they don't like it either. Like, yeah. you know, versus like language like we could use that would be like restorative or like, um, I don't know, there's just so many different uses of language that just suck. And exactly what Norm said, like that they, that they lose this battle, like transcending into another world or whatever the heck happens when we die isn't a loss like I actually I don't even like that word either like you lost your child or you lost your father 
because in the spiritual realm, they're all with us still and they're all around us. And like, it's so interesting to me too, dad, that your mom was communing with the dead as a job and with her crystal ball and that then you grew up believing that any ghost that came up to us was a demonic entity and that when you die, you just go off into another place and there's no more communication because what I've been learning and what your mom has been teaching me and just like the awakenings that I've had lately, like no one, no one goes away. Like energy can never go away. It doesn't right. dissipate and disappear. Created, right? Yeah. So it's like absurd. And I think we have missed so much that like the indigenous practices from all over the world had such and still do have such a healthy relationship with death that they're able to like understand the passing of people and that that it's like a beautiful thing and a spiritual thing and that those people don't leave you that they they stay and even more than that that they can help guide you and they can help move things in the spiritual realm for you like when the bible talks about all of the entities that come to our to our side or I'm <laughs> trying to be more eloquent but well, like when they come to our rescue and they answer a prayer the bible says that things happen in the spiritual realm that we can't even imagine like when an, when someone makes a prayer and an angel takes like 75 days to get there in the bible <laughs> like yeah. i remember hearing those stories and thinking so they're saying there's a whole spiritual realm but what are these spirits? Like, why wouldn't they be our ancestors and the people who already love us? Like, even Monroe and Van were such spiritual guides to me. Ezra just, like, ran up to me right now. Like, he is, I have such a spiritual connection with him. And even, too, Dad, you remember you used to tell us that animals don't go to heaven. Like, what a weird, what a weird spiritually elitist thing to say. Like, no offense to you, but like, whoever told you that was so wrong. Because. Yeah, I believe that well. Yeah. I, I just want to be at peace with the way things move and change. And also, like, you guys aren't getting any younger. And I have not had. I know. Unless those potions you guys have been mixing are working, let me know. Yeah, well, that's a secret for later. I mean, I myself do not want to live, like, too long. I, I just want to accomplish a lot and stick around to really enjoy it. I don't want to be sick for a long time. Like, you know, I don't... Whatever. I just I just wish that we would have a more complex and nuanced and, like, interesting conversation about death that was you just know, like standard in mexico how the people in mexico see death they even celebrate it on the day of death yes and they think yeah. that's when like the portal is the thinnest and yeah. that's why you can commune with the dead and that's why like actually like my ancestors got like divinity um babsha have been telling me to build an altar and, like, I was taught in evangelical Christianity that altar was, like, I mean, that would be demonic. That's witchcraft. That's, like, terrible. And it's, like, not at all. I want to put a picture of, I have Aunt Marie over here already. I want to put beautiful, like, artwork of, like, everything that really resonates with me in my heart. I want to lay things down that symbolize what I want. I want to burn things that I want to get rid of, like... I was taught all of that was witchcraft, but in reality, it was all bullshit. It was all fear-based religions teaching us to be afraid of our individual power. And what did God say that we would do even greater than he? Jesus didn't say, stay so humble and like spend your whole life singing these bullshit songs and like sexually assaulting people and like not doing a good job at spreading my word like it's gotten so far away from the original intent did you see that video of the dalai lama tongue kissing a little boy no i didn't see that it is disgusting 
the Dalai Lama and Gandhi and all of these spiritual leaders in Christianity that are falling left and right deserve to fall because they have been predators. And I don't know how we let predators get into power, but they have run rampant in those spaces because they teach people not to trust themselves. They teach us not to talk to each other about sex, not to do these witchy things to heal ourselves, to not take, like, we were so indoctrinated into fear. And it's Christian. They were not Grand Gandhi was not Christian. Well, Dad, I worry that like you and still mess with churches that are like that, that are like based in fear. Like what he needs is like radical, radical healing. And that would include plant medicine. There's amazing things happening with like ketamine treatments and um what's it called? Ayahuasca, mushrooms, like we were taught to demonize these things, but we were taught so because of money. Like cannabis oil was made illegal in this entire state um, based on this like racist propaganda that was created by um, William Hearst, who was the head of all the newspapers. Just like there's some big wig at Fox News and CNN who like pulls all those strings like they all just made people afraid of this shit so that we wouldn't know that we had these modalities because we would rather give people pills and charge them so much money for it. He has been in so much pain for his entire life and I'm sick of seeing it. And it breaks my heart that he's going to churches and listening to people who are telling him that he needs to repent and that he's a sinner because he already has enough shame. And he doesn't need any more shame. He needs to be empowered. He needs to like fuck all of that off and really understand that he has his own co-creator with Christ because there's such a better life out there for him and I want him to have a chance of it. But I get so mad at these churches because they keep people in a state of fear and repentance and they tell them to fear the things that will actually heal them. No, I don't think, no, I don't think that's the whole story. The uh, repenting thing means coming closer to God. Yeah, but these you know? places don't present the message like with the heart of it. Like people get stuck in these shame loops. Like haven't you noticed the shame loop that people get into in in like these evangelical Christian circles? Like that's why I'm so mad at the church. Like it's all of these things that they're not looking at and that they're lying to themselves about and therefore lying to other people about. And it's keeping us stuck. I, I'm going to this church now. It's the uh, uh, Cathedral uh, uh, Calvary. Calvary Chapel. right? Well, everyone was nice, but he told you guys not to believe in climate change. And I don't even know why the hell he even brought that up. It wasn't even relevant to the message. He's just drinking this Kool-Aid and that has nothing to do with spirituality. That is an indoctrination and that is fear-based. Like, I'm sick of all of that and I love community and I love that you seek out to be in the presence of God, Dad. Like, you really always taught me how to commune with God and take seriously like that one-on-one -on -one time on my knees with him and I have maintained that my entire life I've never been able to let that go and you were an example of that and I'm really grateful for that and I love that you're still going to church and it makes sense that you want to be in that community and you want to hear really good messages and you deserve really good messages but I don't know what is wrong with these churches where they are taking away women's right to choose, taking away like so many human rights and all in the name and guise of Jesus, like they got themselves in political mess. Like if Jesus was walking into those temples, he would be overturning every single one of their tables. Well, you went know, to the church I'm, I'm going to, they, 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 they paint a different picture of what you're saying. Well, the climate change thing pissed me off. But I liked the rest of the message. Well, you know, he said climate change did not exist? Yeah, he made a joke about how 
like um, God's divinity is like more powerful than climate and some joke about like, and it was so weird because he did it in a scientific way. He was bragging and flexing about the scientific knowledge he had about all of these weather events in society or in society, in the world. And then he ended it by like, I don't even remember what the joke was because it wasn't funny, but the message was that climate change isn't real. <laughs> and it pissed me off because I was like, because dad, that's political. That's not spiritual anymore. That is the church being messed up in the politics. And like, it's a perfect example too of why the church turns people off because I liked that whole message. I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, okay, and, and dad found a really good church. I'm happy. I think this is a safe place. And then he ended it by saying something political and it completely put a bitter taste in my mouth. That's a shame. And you should tell him that if you feel comfortable because it's alienating to those of us who care about this world and where it's headed and actually do our research and listen to multiple views on it and come to the conclusion that it's real. Like he's going to be dead before Valentine is and he can screw himself if he's going to lead a flock of people into voting against climate change initiatives because that's going to make a hell on earth for Valentine. Like, that's what I care about. So I thought, how dare he bring in something political? That has nothing to do with my spirit. And that is telling spiritual people that if you want to be spiritual, you better vote in this way. Politics have poisoned the church. Satan, like, has his greasy, grubby little fingers all up in those places because of politics. Well, you know, it's a shame because it's true. He is, he's he's a great man, and he's he's really he he uh, he tends to uh, sometimes reflect what the society is going on to have. And you can ask, we went. Uh, I'd say we've been going. How many times did I go to church? Do you remember? There was at least six times, I think. Well, anyway, he did say that ninety-seven percent of scientists do not believe in global warming. Who said that? Yeah, he said that and... Uh, no, who said that? The pastor. Your pastor said that. Pastor Phil, the one on church I'm going to. Yeah, so he is lying to a flock of a sheep. And he's lying to them in a very egregious way. Because the more that people are indoctrinated by the poison of politics, the less likely they are to do the humane right thing for this society. It is poison. Politics are absolute poison. Because they're not based in reality, Dad. That is absolute and utter bullshit. That is a lie. And he's lying to you. And if you, and if you believe it, I would just ask you... Do you believe it because you heard it at church and therefore you associate no, it with Christ? No, no. no I, I, I've been doing it, uh, I, I, reading a lot of stuff about climate change. And the, yeah. the climate is always changing. That's the nature of the climate. What are your sources? Prager University? Okay, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple different sources. Uh, for example, I was on... Uh, YouTube about I don't know, like about a week ago, and they had this famous scientist. I'll, I'll have a look up his name to you. Uh, I'll send it to you. And he claimed that around the globe there are uh, stations set up like instruments to monitor the climate, and, and once uh, once a week, maybe once a month. As somebody goes around to all these monitoring devices and takes the data from them. Like, how did the climate change where that device is? And they take all that information and put it into a, one data bank. And the results of that data was that there basically is no radical climate change because there's climate change all the time, but not, not the way... Uh, 
the, 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 the politicians are making it out to be. But what is this resource? What is the source? Okay, I'll have to... I'll find it. Dad, you're you're an educator. You're an intellectual man. Like you, you, your objective as a learned person should always be. I would expect it to be that you lean into like peer based research, fact based evidence, and if any of the conclusions make you uncomfortable, I do not think that's your fault. I think. Like for me, it's the indoctrination of the church. It's the assembly of the church with these people. Like, I cannot explain to you how it feels as a woman, having been sexually assaulted multiple times in her life, hear a man say that he can grab any woman by her pussy and treat women like absolute and utter shit his entire life and then be welcomed into a space that I thought was sacred like that is the most mind-numbing thing I've ever seen and it's incredible that we talk so much about the antichrist and how he's supposed to be someone who charmed the whole church um, and that it was really charismatic and led people astray it sounds sure, familiar to me sure there she said uh, uh televangelist uh you know, and uh, I can't think of any trouble names now. But they even, uh, they even got uh, uh, Joe Austin. And, and, you know, they, they say he is he is misleading a lot of people because he's, make, he's painting the picture that uh, you don't have to worry about repenting. You don't have to worry about, you know, confessing your sins and trying to be a good Christian. He's talking about that God is love and he'll forgive everything. He doesn't even talk about forgiveness at all. And all he talks about is if you, you know, you pray to God, you'll get rich, you'll get a new car, you'll get, I mean, he, he talks about, he, he's what we call a feel, feel good uh, preacher. The prosperity yeah. gospel, right? He, yeah, it's the, right, right. And, and, and that's another that's another one of Satan's little tendrils that he's got wrapped in the evangelical church, this prosperity doctrine and nonsense. Yeah, yeah. And white supremacy. Oh my god. Watching the racism of people who are calling themselves Christian has also been the most eye-opening, insane thing I've ever seen. And it is deplorable because all of this pushes people away from Christ consciousness. It is so, so, so misaligned with the original intention of Jesus Christ. And the way women are being treated and our bodies are being enforced upon is such a violation of human dignity and like each person's imago day. If Christ says each of us is made in God's image and our bodies are being infiltrated in that way, a woman can get raped and she's being forced to carry a child. That is such an egregious overstep. And it's supposedly coming from people who claim to have the same Christ consciousness that I do. I am not fucking seeing it. All of your husbands are cheating on you. All of you are being lied to and told that you're like saving yourself from marriage is going to save your soul. These are such gigantic distractions so far away from the point. And it's so interesting because I was I was on a, such a restrictive diet of sexuality that I swung so far in the other direction to abusing and hurting my body. And I had no self-worth in that area. So men abused me as well. And I couldn't even recognize it, couldn't even advocate for myself. And now that I am meditating, doing things people called witchcraft, taking, doing therapy, ha enjoying psilocybin and these like interesting modalities for healing, doing yoga, which they say is demonic, and ecstatic dance and just like, inner child healing, all of that stuff that I was taught was so wrong. Now that I'm completely aligned in that, or at least striving to be, I am celibate. 
I have no interest in having sex with anyone because I, I know I have the image of God inside of me more than I've ever known that in my entire life. And people all over the place call me the bad one that's not a Christian. Wow. Well, you know, you kind of remember that there's good people and bad people in this world. Of course. There's going to be a shining example of Christ. There's going to be people that are going to mock him. And, and these televangelists are really, really raking their flock. Taking their money and yeah. their well-being and, and oh, it's well, I just think the whole political thing in church is a whole new game. It's disgusting. A whole new game. Yeah, we don't have politics in our church. You do, Dad. That's the thing. It's a, it's a little, little tendril. And it's all based in fear. All of these news programs that are feeding Christians complete and utter lies and telling them that Jesus is saying it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's absurdly, it's literally satanic, Dad. It's literally people worshiping an upside down cross because Satan and the original term means the divider. All of this division, white people, black people, Christians, Jews, um, poor people, rich people, all of these lines in the sand, like that's why the prosperity gospel is disgusting because it draws a line in the sand. It says you're more holy if you're rich. And all of that is complete bullshit. It's antithetical to everything Jesus ever said. And people are trapped in these things because fear is at the root of all of it. It's a, a fear of lack and a fear of abundance, like a lack of abundance. And all of these like people that are stopped, that, that are choosing to like not work anymore. After the pandemic, they got to like sit long and hard and think about their lives and how they're spending all of their hours and how unjust the system is. And it's all starting to crumble because people are like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm not even happy in my life. And then these churches come and manipulate people by saying, come to us. We'll show you how to find that prosperity. But then they tell you yoga is demonic. You go to hell if you have sex. You go to hell if you masturbate. You go to hell if you have an abortion. Like, these are all non-spiritual, political, whatever. Yeah, I'll go along with that, yeah. But I still think that there are more good people in the world than bad people. Oh, well, thank you for bringing that up because I wanted to say that, Dad. Like, these individuals are gold. Like, <laughs> Aaron's mom is an evangelical Christian and it's so funny to me because I see all of it. Like, I know what it is to, to be in that mindset. And she's such a vibrant, interesting, fun, funny, sassy, sexy woman. <laughs> and she has all of these fear-based things that pop up. And that's what the evangelical church does. It, like, makes you afraid of your own power and sensuality and, like, your own, le like, ability to be God and to know God. And that's not a blasphemous thing to say because Jesus said the Holy Spirit made us all, like, the masters of this universe. It's our birthright to be like these Imago days, these images of God. And the point I was going to make is that the individuals are incredible. Like, you, Dad, are a bit sucked in that culture in my mind, and you are one of my favorite people on planet Earth, and I love you so much. So it's not the individual. It's the indoctrination. It's, it's that seeds have been planted, and they are springing rotten fruit. We have a whole yard that we, we have a whole Eden we can be planting in, and we need to rip out all these trees of white supremacy, of prosperity gospel, of sex is evil, uh, like all of this stuff. They're just rotten trees. We can, we can take them out because the root of it is beauty. There's so many beautiful people in this world and they're being completely zombied out by this bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have... Like in a church, when I go there, like we, we get there a little early, and I, like nine o'clock, the service starts at 10, 
a weekend there earlier, they have a little cafeteria, and we we talk because uh, I don't get a chance to talk to you that much. And you know, he's always right or he comes in. I mean, when we ask him to to help something in the house here, he comes right out and helps us. Of course, he's an angel. He is, and he, he just takes off like Mom would say. You want to stay for dinner, or you want to stay for lunch, or whatever. Oh no, no, I gotta get going. I got uh, Mrs. Snark's uh, toilet is overflowing. I gotta get <laughs> By the way, did you hear Candy bought a house? Oh my God, she's such a boss. I love her. <laughs> That's awesome. Look, look at these angels breaking these cycles of a generational trauma as it comes to wealth. Erin is like. Fuck this shit. I am going to be wealthy. And when she came here and visited, she was like, kind of, I feel like she might have implied, like, should I feel guilty about it? Or maybe I implied, should someone feel guilty about that? And then we were both like, no, there's no shame in being like, I want a better life. I want abundance in my life. I want to take care of things. I don't want to see this toxic cycle of poverty anymore. So it's amazing that Erin said that. And now you're telling me Kaylee bought a house. <laughs> And little Danny's in finances. <laughs> uh, exactly. And Chris bought a house, and I'm fitting to buy a house <laughs> with my seventy seven dollars in my bank. <laughs> She's got a house. It's not, yeah. she's, she's not there yet. I have it picked out. And Dad, did I tell you it has a rose garden? Yeah, yeah, you did. It was That's built. So yes, it was. You have a direct connection to my mom there. I do. I do. Uh, you know, I was telling you, I told you about how I thought my mom uh, really, really hurt me bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I know, you know, I prayed about it. I said, I don't know why you did this to me, mom. Why did you, you know, almost like curse me? And, uh, and I found out that I realized, so I got an answer came into my head of the, all the drugs she was taking. Uh. It, it wasn't her speaking to me. It was the drugs talking to me. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. And you know what? Like, she is telling me that she had chronic pain, that she survived multiple sexual assaults that were violent that her womanhood was destroyed in some ways and that her body had lasting chronic pain throughout. Let me tell you something real quick that kind of plays in with what you're saying. Every Halloween, my mom wanted to get dressed up for Halloween and it was, she looked forward to it. And you know what she dressed herself as? What? A man. <gasps> oh my god, I just gotta chill. Oh my uh, god. Rich man, rich man. She, yeah, she uh Oh and, my god. Uh, yeah, it was really frightening. I remember that when I first saw her dressed as a man and 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 I said to my dad, I said, What's mom doing? And he shook his head like, Leave her alone, leave her alone. <gasps> my dad Dad Oh my god, that is the coolest thing you could have ever told me. Because this brings up the sub, yes, this brings up the subject of gender and non binary. Like, of course, the first thing I think of is that it's so interesting because so many years since she was a little girl surviving a war, men had assaulted her and harmed her. So for her to take back that power, and I've always said, I've always said that. On Halloween, we dress as the, per the the thing that we are really wishing we could express in our reality. Yeah, and I looked at my, exactly, uh, you're Dr. Blood, Dad. And it's so funny. It's like this creepy, haunted house, villainous, like very fun and playful, like Disney-esque character that comes out of you, which is so you. And... I realized in my like childhood uh, photo albums that moms kept such a beautiful job. Thank you for doing all of that, mom. <laughs> um, 
but the archivalist. But um, I dressed as a clown multiple times in my childhood and adulthood. And then one day I was like, there is a theme here. <laughs> this is so funny. Like, I'm a clown at heart and I want to entertain and I want to be funny. And like, and yeah, it's so funny. So it's like, I totally realized that when you said that, there's something so dark and eerie about the fact that she had to do that and masquerade as a man. Because even last night, I heard a trans man, or no, it was, um, no, it was a woman talking about how she passed as a man throughout the pandemic because she wore a, um, she had to wear the mask the whole time. And she was delivering Postmates and stuff. And she was like, I never felt so free. I never felt like so safe. And she said it was the height of the pandemic. She was going places alone and she felt so safe. And that plays into why your mom did that. I never realized that. Yes. why did she get dressed up as a man? And she she got everything that the pants. I mean, when when she came out of the, her bedroom, coming downstairs, my dad and I were sitting on the sofa, and my mom walked into the room, and we thought it was the guy. And and you know, uh, my dad jumped up, and you know, he said, "Who are you? What do you want?" You know, it was a housebreaker or something. And then my mom started laughing. <laughs> So she wanted to show off. Yeah, she wanted to show off. How does a man versus a woman smoke a cigarette? How, how does a man smoke a cigarette? You said she smoked a cigarette like a man and not a woman. So how did men smoke then and how did women hold their cigarette? Well, for example, a woman, when she smokes a cigarette, it's what I would call uh, dainty. Or, uh, <laughs> you know... Uh, well, when, when when a woman sp- smokes a cigarette, she puffs the cigarette in a very. And it's between her two index fingers, right? Yes, yes. And then a man smokes a cigarette like James Dean, and they make a big show of it. Like a thumb in the in the in the, in the pointer. Yes, thumb in the right, and and a woman will never. Uh, at, at that time, oh, well, she has a cigarette in her mouth. Whereas a man would always do that. You know, the cigarette would be flopping and hanging and the little pieces of ashes. <laughs> oh, so she smoked the cigarette like a, like a vaudevillian, like Laurel and Hardy style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's and really funny. All the mannerisms of men. She, she had a down pat, man. She even had like a, like a hat, like a Jeff hat. You know what a Jeff hat is? Um, it's like a newsboy cap? I don't know what we call it. It's like a cap, yeah. But it was uh, not really a cap. Uh, it was usually like a fabric, you know, from the back and the, to the, the front, and then it had a rim in the front. Right. Yeah, yeah. Jeff okay. It's Jeff. Jeff had. And uh, she had that. And she even changed her. Uh, she had like an undershirt and a, and a shirt on top of the shirt. And uh, and, and then her uh, shirt with a long sleeve. I remember that well. And it was buttoned at the wrist, you know. And she had work shoes on. My dad's work shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Stomping around. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's great. Did she, like, talk differently and stuff? Like, did she present herself differently? What's that? Did she like, present herself differently? 
Yeah, she did. She did. She she took a persona, a total persona of a man. I, I know if we didn't know her, uh, we would say was a man. This is amazing. Because, so the other level to it is that now that this new generation has come in to school us on so many things, this new generation has burst in to say, we don't care about these gender binaries. We don't resonate at all with this idea of having boys do this, girls do this. I don't want to dress this way. I don't want to present this way or even... I genuinely am not this person. I am not a man. I am not a woman, despite what my genitalia shows you or thinks you are seeing with it. <laughs> that wasn't eloquent, but you know what I'm saying. Um, but like we're being taught by, again, the church that and politics for God knows what. Oh, I guess it's because church is now infusing itself in politics. It's like a double poison because they bounce off of each other. These toxic, awful figures that have come up in evangelicalism and run the world of Christianity have the all the politicians in their pocket because they have so much of the parishioners money. These guys just have so much money that they can literally just say, let's just uh, take away trans people's rights because I, I feel weird. And my mom said when I was little that like trans people are scary. And like, that's not enough of a fucking reason to take away someone's human rights. And yet here we are doing it and calling ourselves Christians. Like, meanwhile, your mom was expressing this part of herself that was a part of herself. And I feel that too. Like I feel very female and feminine and I love my feminine energy, but I take care of everything in my home. And I do so many quote masculine things that I feel very, I feel like a powerful man. I resonate with that. And I don't know, like the distraction of us being told that any of that matters on a spiritual level, except though, I will say it matters in the other direction. Like for evangelicals to obsess with it makes no sense. It's like, dude, this has nothing to do with you. If you're not trans, if you're not non-binary, like have fun, eat your apple pie and do whatever you need to do. But like a person who is stuck in that home, who's like a 13 year old female presenting person who actually knows that they're a man on the inside, like for them to be stunted and oppressed and told there's something wrong with them and they're not good enough for God. Are you out of your mind? That is not Christ consciousness. That's psychotic. That is absolutely psychotic. And what is this all based on fear? We get a little afraid when we see a man in a dress and we've had a lot of movies come out throughout history. Like there's an amazing documentary. Um, I'm made by a trans woman. I'm forgetting her name. But it's all about how trans people have been vilified in our movies. And they're always the villain. Like Norman Bates dressing up his mom to kill people. Like that is a trope that's been played out in cinema and story. But in reality, like the original art and artists were making art that honored the non-binary. And Shakespearean plays, like they all gender swapped. And for many years, like nobody gave a damn about that because it just wasn't relevant, especially among the artist community. And, and that's where people create from. Like, these drag queens that Christians are trying so hard to oppress and vilify, like one of them made the best point. They were like, um, there's not a huge slew of drag queens who are out here assaulting children, but maybe you want to check inside your church doors. And oh, oh, it, it is that is there no truer statement than how many leaders we've seen fall and the Dalai Lama putting his he, t he asked a child, a boy, to suck his tongue. And I think uh, he must have had a moment in his old age where he forgot where he fucking was. And he played out some behavior that unfortunately I guarantee has been happening behind the scenes. And as the mother of a boy, I am disgusted. 
And I don't even know where that comes from, but it definitely comes from us propping up mere mortals, mere men, and pretending they're gods. Like, I like what the Gandhi or the Dalai Lama had to say about things. And I say the Gandhi without apologizing for my disrespect because it also came out that he was sexually assaulting children and molesting them. So I don't have respect for them anymore. Yes, all of these men have fallen. And like, I have a heart for that actually because no one should be propped up as a God. It's too much responsibility and it's not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to have a hierarchical structure in our society. We're supposed to be equal as God intended. And we're supposed to live in community with each other. Like single moms have it so rough out here because the men leave and then they're stuck paying all the bills and doing everything. Like if we had a tribal community and we didn't live in these big houses, like poor communities do community pretty damn well because they need each other. But wealthy people need each other too. How many wealthy people I know that are like, drug addicts with high-end drugs or like have really terrible backstories or like a lot of childhood trauma or their parents weren't there because they were with a nanny like no one is better than anyone else and no one has it easier than anyone else it just looks different but if we were actually equal it would be seeing the christ consciousness and the god image in everyone and and taking out all of these structures of who's in charge because no one's in charge except the divine god right. jesus right. yahweh let me let me give you one one more note that you can add to uh what i told you about my mom yeah uh, like my sister she wanted to take a picture of my mom as a man and i mean my mom as long as there wasn't a camera around she would frolic and act as a man you know and even uh like uh you know my dad wasn't too happy about it (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but anyway my mom would not allow anybody to take pictures of her as a man. One time, one time she got mad at, at Irene and said, said to her, I'm a woman, I'm not a man, so don't take a picture of me as a man. And she said, but mom, you're the, that's only Halloween, I'm not a man. <laughs> said, yeah. That's really interesting. And then she was like, felt that she was degrading herself by acting as a man. <laughs> I don't know. She <clears throat> She sounds pretty non-binary to me. If she if she gets reincarnated in another life where she's allowed to be that, she might be that. You don't believe in reincarnation, do you? Dad, I believe that we don't know anything. <laughs> And are, are you, like, I, I feel like you're asking that, like, do you dare believe in reincarnation? I ask you, do you dare not believe in reincarnation? That's just as audacious and insane, if not, in my opinion, more insane. No, the Bible clearly says. No, it doesn't, Dad. The Bible doesn't clearly say shit. The Bible was written by a bunch of men. They kicked women out of the entire narrative. And it's been translated over 400 times by bullshit artists who added the words homosexuality in 1946. That book is not to be worshipped. It's a book and it's mistranslated horribly. And it's definitely mistaught. I have to, I have to educate you, Brenda. Oh, please educate me, Dad. Tell me something new. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to go because uh, Lauren and I are meeting with a director we might work with who's, like, really awesome. So it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> That's great. That's just great. And this is great, Mom. These are the kind of conversations we'll have in Delaware. Yeah, that sounds good. We're going to pick this up in Delaware, right? Setting the tone. All right, sweetheart. All right, love you. I love you too. More than you know. God bless you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.